All right, friends, it's time to give you loyal listeners a discount on protein powder. You may or may not know, but I launched my very first protein powder two years ago. It's a grass-fed beef isolate with only three ingredients, grass-fed beef, either organic cacao or organic vanilla, and organic monk fruit. Now, if you don't want any of the added flavor and sweeteners, you can also just get unflavored. And no matter what flavor you choose, you're getting over 23 grams of protein per scoop, which is gonna keep you full and satisfied between meals. I love starting my day with a Fab Four smoothie and breaking my fast with that much protein. It makes a serious difference in my cravings and blood sugar balance the rest of the day, and I've seen it with my clients as well. Now, I never thought I'd own a product company, but when I got pregnant with Sebastian, I realized the majority of protein powders were chemically extracted or enzymatically extracted, and I wanted to use heat and water only. I wanted minimal ingredients because we don't need those emulsifiers, fillers, or added vitamins, minerals, and probiotics. All of those additions increase the chances that it's not gonna work for your body, whether it be bloating, digestion issues. I just wanted pure clean protein to keep you full and satisfied so you could build the most delicious Fab Four smoothie. And I have to say, I'm pretty proud of the flavor. If you take a look at our reviews on Amazon, you'll see five-star reviews for flavor. And that is key because if you don't love your Fab Four smoothie and you don't love drinking your protein powder, you're not gonna do it. It won't become a habit and it's consistency that outpaces everything. So. If you're here and you're listening and you want to give our protein powder a try, use the code PODCAST5 for $5 off your order. And let me know if you love it. My favorite ways to apply this protein powder is in my Fab Four smoothie, making freezer fudge, making chocolate milk, making hot chocolate, and throwing the unflavored into all my kids' baked goods. So let me know how you use it. Let me know if you love it. And share this podcast deal with your friends. Today's guest is Chris Kresser. He's a practitioner of integrative and functional medicine and the creator of chriscresser.com, one of the most respected natural health sites in the world. He developed your personal paleo code based on over 10 years of research, his own recovery from a debilitating decade long illness and his clinical work with patients. Co-director of the California Center for Functional Medicine, Chris Kresser founded the Kresser Institute in 2015 to provide the next generation of functional health practitioners and coaches with the skills and tools they need to turn the tide of chronic disease and change the future of medicine. Chris is the author of The Paleo Cure and Unconventional Medicine and the host of Revolution Health Radio. Chris Kresser has personally been a role model and an inspiration for me for over 15 years. He puts out science-backed information and has a really balanced approach with his patients. It is an absolute personal and professional pleasure to welcome Chris Kresser to the Be Well by Kelly podcast. Chris Kresser, I can't even believe I'm saying your name. Welcome to the podcast. Kelly, it's such a pleasure to be here. I'm excited about the show. Well, I'm your biggest fan, not only of you and the books you put out, and I mean, really everything you put out into the world, but probably of your podcast. So if people are tuning in here, another great podcast you should go listen to is Chris Presser's and just everything you've done for so long. So thank you. I'm an OG fan since the, you know the early 2000s. So thanks for doing what you do. Well, thank you, Kelly. Appreciate your work and appreciate your advocacy. It's we need all of the voices out there that we can get to move this forward because, as you know, we're uh, unfortunately things are not headed in the right direction still in terms of the epidemic of chronic disease that we're facing, and COVID has only exacerbated that further. So, really, really glad to be here. Oh. I'm, I couldn't agree more. I mean, all boats and I mean, as many loud microphones and megaphones as we can get our hands on is so helpful in getting people the right information and really getting to the root cause, which is what you do, the root cause of the issue to prevent these lifestyle diseases. So can we start with your story though? How did you get started in what would be considered unconventional medicine or functional medicine? Well, it's a pretty common story, I think, for folks in our field. I was traveling around the world in, in my early 20s. Maybe that part is not super common, but I um, spent about a year traveling around the world and surfing and got really sick in Indonesia and took a long time to figure out what was going on. Doctors were very well-meaning, but really not 
prepared to deal with the complex chronic issues that I was facing. And I saw probably 30 different doctors in three different countries and spent about 10 years on my journey back to health. And in that process, discovered an ancestral diet, aka paleo type of diet, which at that time was not the buzzword that it <laughs> became <laughs> several years later. And also discovered functional medicine, which again, you know, when you went to a functional medicine conference back at, at, at that time, like around the early 2000s, there were like 15 people in the room, not several hundred as there are now. And so all of these concepts were new at that point, but they were instantly appealing to me and made perfect sense. And, you know, through a lot of experimentation and trial and error, and also the support of some really smart people, um, some of whom later became my mentors when I you know, decided to pursue this as a career, I was able to recover my health. And, and in that process, also decided to um, take what I had learned and help others to do the same because I saw a big need for that. And, you know, I, I knew firsthand what it was like to experience those kinds of symptoms without the, the help that was necessary. And, um, and so I wanted to be there for other people in that place. And you have been for such a long time. When you look at your past and the healing process that happened for you, how much are you attributing your healing to a paleo diet? It was one of several components that was instrumental. So, and I still eat that way for the most part. But it, my first book, The Paleo Cure, outlines what I called at the time a paleo template, which is not a strict paleo diet as outlined by you know, folks like Lauren Cordain uh, or Rob Wolf, uh, although I think Rob has, has softened over the years. I know him well, and, and, and I think he basically follows a paleo template type of approach at this point as well. So, you know, paleo is a kind of starting place, but I actually do great with full fat dairy like butter and cream and fermented dairy in, in moderation like kefir and, and even some yogurt and hard cheeses and stuff like that. Um, I can I can occasionally eat some some grains, um, so you know maybe like a sourdough gluten free bread on occasion, or and sometimes like some lentils, dark chocolate. Uh, so I'm I'm not like in my mind I'm not on a diet. I'm not mm. trying to you know stick to something on paper. Um, I'm just eating the foods that I know are nutrient dense, anti inflammatory and that I enjoy and that make me feel good because I think that's a really <laughs> critical but sometimes ignored part of the equation. Right. Uh, compliance, being able to do it, make it when it feels like it's not a diet, when you're not being told to do something, um, the ability for someone to stick to something drastically improves and that changes our outcomes. Totally. Yeah. When you look at the chronic lifestyle diseases, and like type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, heart disease, metabolic syndrome, all of these sort of buzzwords that are happening right now, but that we know have pretty bad outcomes when it comes to COVID-19. What suggestions do you have for people when it comes to changing their diet and how it can support those lifestyle diseases? Well, the first is that it's never too late to start. And this is, I think, a huge missed opportunity with COVID. And when, when COVID first started, one of, I mean, one of my biggest disappointments in how this has been handled is, is the complete lack of focus on the need to address chronic disease as not only over the long term, but even as a short and medium term strategy for reducing the burden of COVID-19. Uh, we know from a lot of studies that uh, you know, somebody who follows, let's say, uh, who's got, who's, who's overweight or obese and maybe has type 2 diabetes or prediabetes, if they follow, let's say, a low carbohydrate diet or, or even a ketogenic diet for 8 to 12 weeks, they can lose significant amounts of weight and they can also see significant reductions in things like fasting glucose, hemoglobin A1C, fasting insulin, triglycerides, inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein, interleukin-6. And that can translate into a very meaningful difference in their risk of a severe outcome you know, if they happen to get 
uh, COVID-19. So maybe initially we could, could have forgiven that because at, at first nobody really knew how long the pandemic would last. And, you know, the initial focus was on more kind of acute changes that people could make. But the reality, I mean, we're 18 months in, right? <laughs> so yeah. it's, it, it, it's, there's been plenty of time for people to make those changes and realize those benefits. And I think everyone has come to realize that we're, this isn't going away. Like COVID is probably going to become a season, you know, it's, it, it's, it's going to become endemic. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no like it's over kind of thing, which we, everybody was hoping for and shooting for where we never have to think about it again. It's going to likely be something that we live with for, you know, who, who knows how long. And so it's, it's, it's really important to make these changes both for, you know, short-term reduction of risk uh, with COVID, but also for long-term disease uh, risk reduction and just quality of life improvement. That's the other thing. It's it's not fun to live with a chronic disease and and to experience everything that comes with that. And it's expensive. <laughs> it, it's you know it's it's bad for a number of reasons. So uh, that's the first thing. Just never too late, and change change can happen quite quickly. Uh, I think sometimes people have the idea that. It, it has to be really hard or it's going to take a really long time. And that's, that's just not the case. The second thing is, I think a focus on diet is really critical. And that's really probably stating the obvious for your <laughs> audience. But as opposed to exercise, for example, I mean, I'm a huge believer in exercise for different reasons, for many different reasons. It's one of the most important things we can incorporate into our routine in terms of just overall health and wellness. But if, you're fo if we're focusing on like weight loss, and improvement of metabolic health diet i think um is even more important and there are a lot of studies that bear that out and so you know shifting to i, I would say if someone is just starting out the three most important things that we tend to focus on in our clinic and just you know getting people started if they're not ready to do a more aggressive approach like a paleo reset or something like that would be to eliminate flour sugar and industrial seed oils those are like the three the three horsemen of the apocalypse i, I call them <laughs> and and you know i i honestly if 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 people just if we could just get rid of those three things or or dramatically reduce the consumption of those things i think our health would be vastly better as a population and that's true individually as well definitely flour and sugar are easy to identify industrial seed oils a little bit more difficult being that they're so like they're everywhere they're mm -hmm. omnipresent in eating out can you explain what are the industrial seed oils and how they are like wreaking havoc on our health yeah so these are um things like soy soybean oil cotton seed oil sunflower safflower the reason that they're referred to as industrial seed oils is that um, they are largely byproducts of, in, of, of industrial processes and companies that, you know, manufacture products using um, the, the plants that uh, make those products used to have to pay to dispose of those oils. And, and through a stroke of marketing and sales genius at one point, they figured out a way to market and sell them as health foods instead. And this was a you know direct product of the idea that was prevalent and still to a lesser degree exists today that you know saturated fats are are harmful and that polyunsaturated fats, which are which these all of these industrial seed oils are very high in, are are heart so-called heart healthy. And um, there are many, <laughs> many problems with that idea. The first is that uh, polyunsaturated fats are really unstable at high temperatures. And so they're very susceptible to oxidative damage and, and becoming rancid when they're cooked or when they're subject to high temperatures. And these seed oils are, the way that they're used in our food system, they're in, you know, chips and crackers and cookies and their, their uh, restaurants use them to fry foods, French fries, donuts, you know, all, all kinds of pro highly processed and refined foods that we either eat at restaurants or that we 
buy at this at the supermarket are full of these industrial seed oils and they are almost certainly going to be rancid and oxidized in that situation for the reasons that I just mentioned. And then if we consume those rancid and oxidized oil, they've been shown to have a, a wide range of negative effects. One of the most recently studied of those is their impact on the gut microbiota. And uh, there's a growing body of research that suggests that uh, oxidized seed oils can wreak havoc on the gut flora. And I'm sure many of you listeners know well now how important the gut microbiota is to our overall health and, and most currently how important the gut microbiota is to our immune function. Uh, 70 to 80% of our immune system exists in the gut and the gut associated lymphoid tissue. And if we're not taking care of our gut microbiota, then our immune system is not going to be um, firing on all cylinders. And we're going we're to be more susceptible to things like viral infections and more susceptible to developing autoimmunity. Right. Well, we now know more than ever how important our immune system is with things like COVID-19 becoming an endemic and probably needing to deal with this every yes. single year. So are there any other things other than industrial seed oils that you are seeing in the literature as being really dangerous and or destructive to our microbiome that you maybe didn't always recommend removing or looking out for that are red flags for you today? Well, I've always been concerned about environmental toxins, but then the unfortunate truth is that the number and volume of toxins that we are exposed to has just grown and grown um, since I first started doing this work. And uh, we live in a, a bizarre world where companies um, are allowed to introduce new compounds into our environment and food supply without proving that they're safe. It's sort of an innocent until proven guilty idea, which I think is is fair in our legal system, but not fair in the case of introducing potential carcinogens and other toxins into the uh, environment and food supply, only to find out a decade later um, that they ha are, are causing all kinds of health problems. And then by, you know, by then it's much more difficult for, you know, regulation or other uh, steps to be taken to, to pull those out of the food supply. And, and then once they're in the environment, that's not so easy to even pull them out of the environment if they're, if they're, if they're lingering uh, in soil or, or other products. So it's, uh, I think that's one of the most alarming trends that I've seen over time. And we now know from uh, just an exhaustive volume of research that environmental toxins are implicated in everything from Hashimoto's hypothyroidism to Parkinson's and dementia to, uh, you know, GI conditions, you know, the, it's, it's, it's basically hard to find a condition that toxins have not been implicated in. And yet it's not really on the radar of the average primary care doctor. They're not doing adequate testing to, to screen for these toxins. And even if they find them, they're, they're not sure what to do because the conception of toxicity that they were taught in medical school is very outdated. So it's, um, you know, the, the idea of toxicity is, was just, uh, even that I learned in school was limited to this concept of acute toxicity, like poisoning, essentially, like lead poisoning or mercury poisoning, like these extreme cases where people often in occupational settings are exposed to very high levels of uh, something with, you know, a known toxic effect, like thallium or lead or mercury, and, and they develop severe toxicity and poisoning symptoms. That's all very well established and acknowledged in the medical literature and amongst, you know, uh, mainstream medical providers. The problem is that's fairly rare. And mm -hmm. There is a whole, there's a whole spectrum of toxicity and exposures where imagine somebody who has mercury dental amalgams that, you know, were not done very well and they're getting a gradual leak of mercury into their system over many years. That person will not test at the same levels as someone who's suffering from acute mercury poisoning. But that doesn't mean that mercury is not having a harmful impact on their system. And in fact, 
there have been studies that have shown that low levels of toxins of the same toxin can have completely different physiological effects as high levels of that same toxin. So that, you know, if, if, some, if a doctor or a researcher is expecting a certain set of symptoms, you know, of, of toxicity to appear with high levels of that toxin, and they're only asking those kinds of questions or looking for those signs or symptoms, then they're going to miss the fact that a different set of signs and symptoms will be present with lower levels of those toxins. And so, you know, this is known and established amongst people who study this, you know, who toxicologists and people who study this, maybe sometimes endocrinologists and people who are really paying attention to the scientific literature on this topic, but it's not very well understood in the mainstream. And it means that a lot of people who have lower level toxicity and what, what we would call chronic toxicity rather than acute poisoning or acute toxicity are being missed and not being adequately identified and treated. Right. And it's not that it's new science. It's been around. But like you said, most practitioners aren't screening for these toxins. They don't, they're not even maybe using clean home, clean home cleaning ingredients in their own home. And they're, they're being exposed to a lot of these things themselves. And the dose, like you said, doesn't always make the poison. It can be low levels that really cause an issue for people. How are you personally screening for these toxins and in the world of endocrine disrupting chemicals and all kind of the toxins we're coming in contact with, it can be really overwhelming for people. Is there a place where you start to suggest your patients clean these things out of their home and their environment and their life? Yeah, the uh, EWG Environmental Working Group has a pretty good uh, section of their website that deals with these kinds of things. I think we, we can break them down into categories. So one category would be personal care products. So anything that you put on your skin or your hair, the, the skin is a very porous barrier. So we have all these barrier systems in the body, right? Lots of people have heard of the gut barrier. All, all of the barrier systems are designed to keep inappropriate things out and let appropriate things in. And the gut is a very sophisticated barrier system uh, and, the, and the lungs to, to, to a probably a little bit lesser degree. But the reason for that is that we, in a natural environment that humans would live in and, and you know, our ancestral environment, we did a lot of trial and error of eating things, right? Some things that were good for us, some things that were toxic. And over time, the gut learned to distinguish between friend and foe and, you know, develop sophisticated mechanisms for keeping things out that shouldn't be there and uh, letting things in that should be there, like food and nutrients. However, the skin did not evolve that same level of sophistication as a barrier system because it wasn't needed. You know, our, our distant ancestors were not using skincare products or yeah. you know, uh, shampoos or other things. And so they, they, there was no need to evolve a sophisticated barrier system in the skin or the scalp and the hair follicles because there just weren't toxins that we were exposed to. Um, that, were, that were entering our body via those routes. Now you fast forward to today when people are generally putting all manner of things on their skin from sunscreen to lotions, uh, uh, to shampoos, to conditioners. And a lot of these products, unfortunately, contain chemicals that for the reason I mentioned before, have not been adequately tested, have not been shown to be safe. And they, they penetrate through the skin. They're actually, the skin like I said, is very porous as a membrane. So lots of things that we put on our skin get into our bloodstream. I don't think people really fully understand that or are aware of that. So I think personal care products are probably the most sensible place to start for that reason. And again, you can go to websites like Environmental Working Group and, and there are lots of good recommendations there about all of the chemicals that tend to show up in in the bad products that you need to avoid and watch out for. And then, you know, help, they rate like healthier natural products as alternatives. So, you know, a lot of people have probably already doing this or they're aware of it in the context of sunscreens and also soaps and shampoos and things like that. But it, it, I, would, I would definitely put a lot of energy and attention there. The second pl thing, place to focus would be the home because that's where most of us spend most of our time. And that would be uh, all of the 
personal care products, or excuse me, home home care, home cleaning products that we use, um, disinfectants, um, cleansers, uh, things that we're you know washing dishes with, washing our laundry detergent, um, you know the 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 dryer sheets that people use are, can be pretty toxic. So there, there's lots of opportunities for um, choosing natural alternatives there that will be a lot less toxic and problematic. And then while we're talking about the home, I would also mention the quality of the indoor air. Uh, indoor air is something like 800 times more polluted than outdoor air. Uh, so we hear a lot about um, outdoor air pollution, and, and of course that is important, but the air that we breathe inside of our home can can be much, much more polluted because of uh, everything from potential mold issues or other biotoxins, from water damage to even just particulate matter that concentrates or volatile organic compounds from cooking. Uh, and then again, some of the you know cleaning products and off-gassing of furniture and stuff like that. And so I've been a big believer in, in air, ventilation and air filtration in the home as a, as a means of uh, reducing exposure to toxins. And, uh, you know, personally, I just, I think that's a no brainer because again, we're, we're <laughs> spending a lot of time, especially with COVID, many of us working from home, you know, cooking, eating, sleeping. I, I, I would probably venture to say that a lot of people during the pandemic are spending you know, upwards of 18, 20 hours, sometimes 24 hours a day in their home, other than occasional errands, uh, going out to the gym or, or, you know, going on a walk or something like that. So really critical to uh, pay some attention to all, all of those factors. Yeah. And air being low hanging fruit in that we can lower that, you know, six or 800% more toxic air by just opening our windows and and getting some fresh air. And you have a little daughter named Sylvie and, mm -hmm. you know, a family and you have a very, very uh, popular functional medicine practice and a podcast. But I'm curious, I mean, with what's going on and the toxins we're in contact with and um, the chronic, increasing chronic lifestyle diseases, what you're doing on, at home base to make sure that and you've obviously taken good care to look into your personal care products and to clean up your home and your air quality. But what are you doing to cultivate health on the home front? Well, it's a lot of the same things, of course, that I suggest on my podcast, my books, my patients. Um, I, I'm a big believer in the basics as being the most fundamental. And so I think the four pillars there are diet, sleep, stress management, uh, and physical activity. And so that's, you know, something where uh, my, my wife and I are, are modeling that for our daughter. Our daughter, you know, has, has been raised with those kinds of, of values from the start. Um, she gets, you know, we're, we're pretty protective of her sleep. She doesn't really have access to screens. She's 10. We're pretty hardcore about that. I think a lot of our friends think we're a little bit crazy. But I, I have very strong feelings about that. And I think uh, too much screen time too soon can be really problematic and can interfere with sleep and cause stress and interfere with physical activity. And so she uh, is very active. She, uh, we moved to Utah a couple of years ago and she got really into riding horses, which I never would have predicted in a million years. Um, uh, you know, growing up in California, I was not around horses myself and my daughter certainly wasn't around horses, but she does that uh, several days a week. And, um, and then in the winter, she skis a lot and, you know, she spends a ton of time outside. She actually, she doesn't go to school. We have, she does what we call self-directed education. So, she gets lots and lots of exercise and activity each day and lots of kind of adventurous stuff as well. Like lately, because we're in shoulder season now between summer and winter here in Utah, we've been training at this facility. It's an action sports kind of facility where they have trampolines and, and like a tumbling floor and a bunch of like stuff where the ski the the local um, ski and snowboarders come and practice their jumping and aerials and stuff in the off season so we've been doing a lot of trampoline work and tumbling and 
just staying super, super active. I think that's one of the most important things. And then, you know, when we eat, we all eat the same, you know, when we sit down for dinner, there's just one choice. We're not, you know, making separate foods for her. We've never done that uh, from the start. So we're all eating together and, you know, she can choose to eat what she wants or doesn't want to eat. We're not force, forcing her uh, to eat anything, but we're, it's just been very clear from the start that this, these are the foods that our family eats and this is what's offered and it's up to you whether to eat it or not eat it. But this is, you know, we're not going to be making separate meals for you as a kid. And I think that's uh, something that I always advise families as well. And then, you know, as she's gotten older, we've just talked more about, I mean, she knows the work that I do and we've just talked in a, as, as a, light in a way as possible, like not, not being, you know, too preachy about it, but just why it, why we make the choices that we make, why we think those are important and why we are, you know, support, want to support her and making uh, similar choices. So it's just kind of ingrained, I think, into our, into our family and our values and, and, and the way that we live at this point. Well, you're, you're doing it with exposure and modeling, which allows for the easiest ad adoption of, of behaviors. But I'm curious in um, community setting, how have you approached specific foods? Say, for example, if, if she's going to a birthday party or she's in contact with maybe the highly processed foods that are laden with those industrial seed oils mm -hmm. and sugar, how as a parent are you approaching those situations um, in protecting yeah. your daughter, but also allowing for her to experience, or if, is that important to you? Um, you know, I know that a lot of parents who tune into this podcast, a lot of moms who are, you know, love health and nutrition and they eat a specific way, but there's a big movement right now, on it, especially with pediatric uh, dietitians that dessert should be served with dinner and we shouldn't label things like a cookie. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, we've we've exp done a lot of different experiments um, in this regard. And I think my belief is that it's be it's better not to be too rigid, and that rigidity will off often backfire. <laughs> you know, yeah. what you resist persists. That's a very tr true thing for human beings in all different categories of life. And if you really are rigid and 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 controlling about something in your child's life, then it's a virtual certainty that that is going to be something that they're going to pursue and do anything that they can to get. And so, you know, my, my one partial exception to that is with, with screen use and media, because, and we can come back to that if you want. But with food, we, we, we tend to be pretty relaxed about those types of events. Like if with, with again a caveat that she's gluten intolerant and so she doesn't have celiac but she is gluten intolerant and so if, if we're going to like a birthday party or something like that and there's going to be cake or cupcakes or something and and we have a pretty good idea that there won't be a gluten-free alternative then we'll try to bring something for her in that situation but if there is going to be something gluten-free and it's you know we're not going to like not let her eat that and and have her just be standing on the periphery you know while yeah. everybody's eating cake and cupcakes i i just i think there's a lot more to life than food and and you know a lot more to raising a healthy kid and a well-adjusted kid than than you know them eating a, a super healthy diet which is important but only one factor so as for the question of like dessert and you know how that's sequenced and how it's even talked about I do think there's some sense in in that in in that um, we've I've actually had a woman on on my podcast who you know works with kids and families on on these sorts of things and that that's her approach is to you know just basically put all of the food that's being offered out at the same time and you know I was somewhat referring to that when I said when when we serve dinner we don't tell her okay now you you know you need to eat this and you need to eat that and you need to eat that and this is how much of each thing you need to eat we just you know let's say we're having uh the other night we had salmon and broccoli and and baked potatoes so we just we don't serve her plate we just 
put all of the, you know, we put the fish on the table, the potatoes on the table and the broccoli on the table. And then she is free to serve herself what she wants. And some nights that will be everything. Uh, some nights it will maybe just be two of those, of the three or four things that we lay out. And, you know, some nights she'll eat just like an incredible amount of broccoli. Like I can't even believe how much broccoli she's eating. And um, then other nights she doesn't eat any, you know, or, or like, so it, it's, it's really like letting go of the idea that there should be some like very regular, consistent consumption and they should eat the the proper sort of, you know, ratio of things on the plate. And that's almost certainly ha totally bizarre and, uh, and unusual for human beings in history, right? Like, especially in a natural environment where we would have had probably pretty inconsistent intake of food. And, you know, if there was a hunt and, and there was a kill, it was probably people eating a lot of meat all at once. And then there might be periods where they were only eating plant foods that they would gather. And, you know, th this, this concept of, of like really structured meals and appetizers and main courses and desserts is all a very modern thing. So uh, we don't worry too much about that. Having said that, um, we do really want to make sure that she's consuming nutrient dense foods. And so we wouldn't, you know, I know there's a kind of radical um, end of that spectrum, which is just like, let kids eat whatever they want, and eventually they'll figure it out. And I don't, think that that's necessarily true uh, or a good approach because sugar has some pretty powerful effects on our physiology and our taste buds. And if a kid is exposed to a lot of sugar, um, in my experience, they will, and, and this is not just true of humans, this is true of, of, of mice and rats and laboratory studies and all kinds of animals they'll just eat more and more sugar and they'll tend to eat it at the expense of other foods that are healthier and more nutrient dense. So uh, what we tend to do is we only, we, we try to set things up so that we only have foods in the house that we're comfortable with her eating at any given time. So that way she can just go into the pantry or open the fridge or whatever and fix her own food. And we don't have to worry about policing it and we don't have to be like on her case all the time about it. And that means that things that we're not comfortable with her eating on a daily basis, like ice cream, are not in the house regularly. So mm -hmm. we, you know, if we, if we have, we tend to have like one night a week, usually we, um, we have a kind of family movie night where we uh, will watch a movie together and then we'll have ice cream maybe once a week. And so we'll go out and we'll get the ice cream and we'll have some. And even if there's a little bit left, we'll tend to toss it. And that's, you know, I don't feel great about that, but we don't want to have it in the house the whole, you know, for, for the rest of the time. We, we also have a chest freezer in the garage and sometimes we'll put it in there. When she was younger, she didn't really know that that was there. <laughs> so now she's older and smart and, and smarter. So, um, you know, some people like there's a possible, I know some people have a, a cupboard or a freezer that has a lock on it in a different part of the house where they put foods like that, that they, they can then bring into the house when they are, you know, are ready for their kid to just, you know, to, to kind of bring that into the rotation, so to speak. But that's worked pretty well for us. I don't think there's, you know, one way to do it, but generally I think it's good to allow kids to develop the capacity to make their own healthy choices as they get older. Because if, if, if the only time they're making healthy choices is when you're around, <laughs> then that's not going to be very sustainable because the older a kid gets, of course, the more they're going to be, the more independence they develop, the more time they're spending outside of the house and so we have let her in certain situations make choices that we didn't think were great choices and let her experience the consequences of the, the natural consequences of those choices. Like, oh, look, you know, <laughs> you ate a bunch of Halloween candy and now you're feeling pretty sick and, and now you got a cold. Well, that's, that's interesting. You know, what, what do you make of that? And, and just kind of have those conversations and not make it really judgy and critical, but just helping her to, to, draw those 
connections, you know, connect those dots and see, oh yeah, this is, I don't actually feel good. I mean, and the result of that has been like, oftentimes if we go out and we order a dessert somewhere, she'll take a few bites and go, oh, this is too sweet. This is really, she doesn't like it because most of the time when we make dessert at home, we make it with about half the amount of sugar that's in the recipe and a different type of sugar, like maple syrup or coconut sugar or something. And so when she orders a dessert that is made for the typical American palate, she's actually quite turned off by it. And, and so I think that sort of thing naturally develops if you give a kid the autonomy uh, for it to happen. Right. You've given her such independence. So many takeaways for me already, even just as a parent. And these are the things I'm curious about because I've followed you for so long and read your books and listened to your podcast. I know how you stand, like where you stand when it comes to your, your patients. And it's just kind of like pulling back the veil and understanding like, how, how do you create a little healthy human that's making those choices on their own? And it sounds like Sylvie has a lot of independence to to make decisions on our own. I'm, I mean, plating things family style, I think that's something I can start including with Sebastian, our three-year-old, maybe not with Tasha and our one-year-old, but just to <laughs> allow him to fill his plate. He's a pretty good little eater. And I think that has to do with the fact that he was given a lot and exposed to a lot, but I know it's already transparent that it's becoming more difficult with, <laughs> with his little brother and it's going back to those basics. And I, and I love the independence that you have there. Um, for her and and not having it around making the choice to say like I'm going to make the choice to dispose of this instead of having to make the choice every time I open the freezer not to have it that's really really smart I would like to circle back to screen time um, and I would when we're done with screen time I'd like to circle back to how you're screening or testing your your family um, we did talk about toxins. I want to know how you're screening for toxins. But if Sylvie's gluten intolerant, you know, how often are you you going under the hood for yourself, your wife, and your daughter too? So um, you can stab at any of those first. Up to okay. you. <laughs> um, well, why don't we talk briefly about screen time because we're kind of on this similar topic of par parenting and choices around that. And then we can come back to testing and, and toxins and all that stuff. Okay. Um, yeah, this screen time is a big topic. I've um, it's been a personal interest of, of mine. The impact of screen time on uh, not only kids but also adults uh, for for many years. In fact, I th I think the last paleo effects that happened before COVID, I, I did a my presentation, my talk on technology addiction, and I've written a lot about this. You know, f films like The Social Dilemma by Tristan Harris, I think, are just a must watch for any human being, but especially parents, um, which really does a fantastic job of reviewing the research uh, and what we know about how these technologies can impact um, developing brains and, and again, even adult developed brains. And look, I mean, I, <laughs> I'm not a Luddite, uh, although sometimes I, I aspire to be. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I honestly do sometimes feel like I would have been much happier in a time where none of this stuff existed and it was, you know, just a more direct, immediate connection with light nature in the real world and not so much time behind a screen. Sometimes I get to the end of the day and I want to throw my computer out a window. But at the same time, because of the nature of the work that I do and you do, um, you know, there's there's no way that I could do it without screen so it's a it's a love hate relationship with for for me personally for sure and i'm not suggesting that we get rid of all this stuff entirely i realize that we need it uh, to function many of us in our in our jobs and our personal lives and i also realize there are a lot of benefits i mean it's i have an incredibly flexible life and and schedule uh, in large part because of technology and i'm i'm super grateful for that so so those are all the caveats now the the flip side is that these technologies are are intentionally and explicitly designed to exploit our basic human vulnerabilities and and basic human traits so you know our brains did not evolve in a time where these technologies existed obviously they're extremely new and 
you know, there are a lot of default hardwired biological mechanisms that helped us to survive in a natural environment that these technologies exploit, at, at, I think, at our peril and, and, and you know, uh, with, with harm t to us. So one of those is, is novelty seeking. So, you know, if our ancestors who were so sought out novelty and pursued novelty and, and were easily distracted by things in their peripheral vision, would have had a, uh, been more likely to survive and pass their genes on. So just imagine two, <laughs> two, two, hy two hypothetical ancestors, right? One, and they're, they're both like sitting on the, you know, sit, sitting on the savannah somewhere. And one is just totally focused and immersed in whatever he's doing and not paying attention to anything else. The other is somewhat distractible and in, in his peripheral vision notices the lion that is stalking them <laughs> and you know somehow gets away while and the other person who is totally focused um gets uh, attacked and eaten so that's maybe a kind of cartoonish example but it's not far from the mark uh, distractibility and novelty seeking are basic uh, human traits that did help us to survive in a natural environment but what happens in an environment where, like today that we're living in, where you've got you know notifications beeping and flashing on your phone every ten seconds, you've got things coming up on your computer screen and email, you know notifications coming in and phone calls and text messages. It's very easy to fall into what Cal Newport calls the hyperactive hive mind, where where it's just one interruption and distraction after the other throughout the entire day. And that then interferes with our ability to sit down and, and concentrate on deep work. Uh, another Cal Newport phrase that I like, you know, just really focus and pay close attention to, to a, a singular activity a, or thing that we want to accomplish. It makes it hard for us to focus our full attention in, our, in relationships and, you know, communication connection that we're having with other people in our life, if we're getting constantly distracted by, you know, input from these other sources, uh, it, it, it's stressful. It, it, there's studies that have shown that these kinds of constant interruptions and distractions and the screens, social media trigger a fight or flight response, which is the same response that we go through in any kind of stressful situation. And so when you put all of that together, Plus the fact that, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, all of these um, apps and technologies employ neuroscientists or brain hackers who, whose job it is to maximize our attention, the, the amount of time and attention that we are investing on, in their platform because that's the business model of social media. Whenever we're using a free service, we are not the customer. We're the product. Right. The customer is the advertiser who's paying that platform. And the rate, the amount that they pay that platform is dependent on how much time uh, we spend. And so the, the sole purpose of that company is to maximize the time that we spend on their platform because that's what generates more ad revenue and that's what makes them profitable and successful. So it's not a fair fight. We have our own individual brains, which are, you know, we're, de we're designed to live in a completely different environment and they're not equipped to, to deal with this kind of assault versus these multinational corporations who employ neuroscientists and brain hackers to exploit those vulnerabilities and, and maximize and harvest our attention. And if you think that's bad for adults, just imagine how it is for kids who are even less able to understand what's going on here and how they're, they're being exploited and less or even less equipped to deal with it because of just their brains not being as developed. They haven't, you know, they, they, don't, they lack the cognitive capacity to understand what's going on. And then the added issue of teenage, teenagers and teenage girls in particular, you know, all humans have a desire to belong to a tribe. We're tribal creatures, but that's, that 
tendency is amplified during the teenage years for both boys and girls, but even more so in girls. And you put that together with everything that I just mentioned, it's just a really toxic recipe. And so I feel very strongly, as you can probably gather, that mm -hmm. these, techno these technologies should be, uh, that we, we, we need limits and we need strong parental guidance and oversight with these technologies with with our first of all with ourselves because you, you know as you as you pointed out it's really important to model appropriate behavior um but especially with our kids and you know i can i can go into what details of of, of how we approach that if you want but i wanted to at least set the stage with why we do that and why I feel so strongly about it and why I'm not as kind of laissez-faire about this as I am about, you know, birthday cake. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, when I think back to growing up without cell phones, when my mom would pick up the kitchen phone and have the cord wrapped around her body when she was cooking dinner, talking to a neighbor, I like to think about those times as the good old days. Like we were mm. in the backyard, we were writing. I mean, I remember you taking like cardboard down a, a pine needle hill because it was like a sled. Like you were creative, you did things, you weren't distracted by your screen. And I am, I am worried about our kids growing up with too much screen time. You see kids on their parents' phones at restaurants. You, I had a, an expert on the podcast around screen time. And I think my boundaries were even stronger. <laughs> and, um, and it is, it's, I mean, I feel like I feel a little less crazy with you on the podcast, to be mm -hmm. honest, yeah. but I'm, but you're setting the stage because it is, it's hard. I mean, we, they're going to be out there. So I would want to know, I mean, what your personal suggestions are and what you're doing in your family. I mean, from our standpoint, I would love to throw, I'd love to throw my phone out the window and never have to post on Insta, Instagram again because it is a draw for me and my business and I and I love putting information out there but it is it's it's constantly there for you it's it's at an arm's reach it's distracting from the deep work it's distracting from those relationships and and from parenting like ugh, it's it's horrible i think sometimes <laughs> like yeah. i i hate i hate feeling that way about it but if i could sometimes i daydream about doing physical work my husband used to break down pallets in like the summer between high school college it was one of his favorite jobs because he said he'd turn on the radio and he just yeah. do physical work and he wouldn't have to like be connected to a computer or email or reading into how things tone and just kind of absorbing everything. It was just like sports radio. Would have some fun, break down pallets and go have a surf and head home and like, you know, eat dinner with his family. And yeah. there are times in my life now where that's like what I I yearn for. I'm like, can I just like build a house or <laughs> be a yeah. chef for someone? Like there because it's just never ending and always there. So yeah. So thanks for making me feel less crazy about it. I'm equally <laughs> as passionate. I remember when AIM became a thing and thinking like, wow, I, I used to play outside and now I want to instant message my friends on the computer and put an yeah. AOL CD in and listen to a dial up so I can connect to that. But yeah, like how do we, how do we, how are you keeping the boundaries strong? And, and what, what are you guys doing? Because I just want yeah. my kids to play outside and be creative. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's another hour long podcast for sure. <laughs> so I, I I think I'll point to some some resources. Um, okay. and I, you know, I can speak briefly about it. I really uh, for anyone who's who's really like wanting to uh, um, explore this more deeply, um, I think Cal Cal Newport is a phenomenal. Uh, resource here, and I, I, I had him. I, I interviewed him for two and a half hours if, <laughs> on my on my podcast. It was one of the longest interviews I ever did. It could have easily been longer. So if you just search for uh, Chris Cresser, Cal Newport, I'm going to bookmark yeah, that one. Yeah, I'll put that, it that, in the pod that, show notes that, too. Yeah, I'm going to go listen to it. That tonight. should come out. So we talk. Uh, we cover a lot of these issues in depth, and I lo I love his book, uh, Digital Minimalism. It's kind of a program that you can follow for getting your relationship with technology under control and making the, the goal of it, which I really appreciate is not 
to white knuckle it and sort of like, it's, it's not about restriction and, and deprivation. It's about making technology work for you and serve you rather than the other way around. So um, he's, he, his program, I think, is, is more sophisticated and more effective than almost any other of the, these like, you know, 30 day screen challenges or things like that. Because most of those are based on just, um, uh, like I said, withdrawal or deprivation white knuckling, like, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to check Facebook. Or I'm not, uh, this, his program is much more based on what is it that I really want in my life? What is it that I is really deeply important to me and reconnecting with that. And then from that place, deciding what level of technology you serves those goals. And I think that's really, really critical. Um, because if you don't do that, it's just you're going to fall back into that like what you resist persists type of thing you know this right. sort of unhealthy back and forth relationship of like i'm cutting it out no i'm off the wagon i'm on the wagon back in it uh whereas if if your guiding light is is really the the you know focusing your attention on the life that you want to live and the the quality of life the types of relationships you want to have with your family and people in your life and the way you want to experience yourself in the world and 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 just your and, and experienced life on a moment to moment basis if if that is all the positive guiding basis for the the decisions that you make they're, you're going to be much more successful sticking with it so so that's been crucial i think overall for me personally and for our family but i um, this is like probably going all the way to the radical end of the spectrum again here <laughs> but uh, one of the most potent concepts that I ever took away from Cal Newport, and I was sort of already had developed it on my own, but he just articulated it so clearly, which is make offline the default. So right now, I, I would say that for most people living in the industrialized world, online is the default. Like no barriers, no no control over notifications, always available, always can access the internet, always can check email, always can, you know, look at social media, always can just jump on the web and look something up. And the problem with that is that there's, there's no, there's no barrier. Right. And there's no, there's no, there's nothing that stops you if you're out on a walk and just all of a sudden you have a thought, oh, I wonder if that person emailed me back pull out your phone, check your email, all of a sudden you've left the, 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 the felt experience of being on a walk, feeling the sun against your skin, breathing the air, seeing you know the, the scenery around you, maybe even talking to someone next to you. And you've left that to, you know, instantly to uh, check your email. And then if, if the email is there and it's something work-related and it triggers you, then you all of a sudden you're in a totally different space, right? Right. And so if you make offline your default and you only go online during certain parts of the day, and those parts of the day can be long and they, they could be frequent. It's not, that's not really the point. The point is that they're dedicated. These are parts of the day that I'm going to go online and do online stuff. It almost sounds kind of anachronistic to say online, right? Because everyone's online all the time. But if you, if, you, if you create certain parts of the day where you know you're going to be online, and then you have other parts of the day where you specifically know you're going to be offline, and those are protected times or periods where you're, you're going to be offline. And even if you have that thought, oh, maybe I should just look this thing up really quick on the, uh, maybe I should check out this restaurant or maybe I should check my email. Instead of doing it, you write it down or, you know, I, I have a uh, app that I just dictate things into. So I, 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 that way I know I'm not going to forget and it eases any anxiety about that, but I don't do it until my next online period. And that has been just an absolute game changer for me in terms of my quality of life and my relationship with technology and and just the experience that I have on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's basically how we've set things up for our daughter. For whatever reason, uh, she is, I think, particularly susceptible to the impacts of screens. And 
we kind of figured that out early on and we've experimented with lots and lots of different things over t over the over the years and what's working best for us at this point is she really we have a family movie night once a week where we watch movie together and then only you know a couple times a week she's a lot she for a half hour she uh she has a I mean, she's all about horses, everything about horses. So there's a, a horse kind of video game where she can breed horses and ride horses. And I don't even know, but it, <laughs> she, she likes it. So she does that for a half hour. Um, and that's about it. That's, yeah. it. you know, we don't, she doesn't have a phone. She doesn't have an iPad. She does. And, and those, those devices, when she is allowed to use them, um, we use an app called, uh, our pact o u r p a c t that i can set up from my phone and it 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 controls her her screen time and screen usage so that we don't have to sit there and monitor it 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 just is it's a, it's on for as long as it's on and then it's off and when when the time's up it's over and that works really well for us i realize that's extreme I mean, we're on the extreme end of the spectrum there but it it's uh what what works best for us and our family well, you're being really proactive about it. Um, probably it is easier for you having um, school be self-directed education versus having yes. friends that have devices around her all the time. Um, but I think the intentionality and the purposeful choices you're making goes back to what you mentioned about Cal Newport. It's going like, what do I want my life to be and build from there instead of starting to say, what is my life now? I'm going to restrict because it feels like a, from a growth place versus from a compression place where you're able to say, this is the type of life I'd like to have. These are the type of family dinners we'd like to have, or these are the days I'd like to build for myself and my family. Um, and you have worked backwards. For someone whose kids are in school with a bunch of kids with phones or people who have a job that doesn't allow for them to have that type of flexibility, what advice would you have for them in regards to making some proactive decisions that can kind of change their daily living? Yeah, I would just say just a smaller version of that, you know, carve out some time that is offline and dedicated offline time. So if you work all day and, and you have to be available, let's say your boss you know, you, you have to be always checking your email, your texts in case your co colleagues or coworkers are, are notifying you and you, you can't afford to just, you know, take four hours and have an offline block, have an hour offline block or a half hour online blo offline block to start with and have some time in the evenings that are offline and have, you know, one thing that I've done for many years is a, is a, a Sabbath, uh, tech Sabbath, I call it, on the weekend, generally on Sundays, sometimes on Saturdays, where for that entire day, I don't interact with screens at all. Um, I, and, and it's amazing to see what I get up to <laughs> on those days where I, where I am not using a screen. It, it's really, uh, you know, it feels essential. So, and if that seems like even a big stretch, try a half day or even two hours to start with it, it it's not the point isn't how much or, or even how frequent you do it it's it's training yourself to have some times where you're not just constantly plugged in to the matrix so yeah. to speak and 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 that you actually and it does require i use that word intentionally training it does require training because once your brain is habituated to that kind of just instant instant contact and and connection and you know like you have a thought to look something up you immediately look it up it can be hard to break that pattern so it's it's good to have periods of time that you train yourself to not do that um and and then you know over time you can work up to longer stretches where you're offline or if you start with two hours on the weekend of no screen you go to a half day eventually maybe to a day and then i also do digital detoxes, you know, that are longer where I'll, and typically away from the home, if I go on a trip or something where, you know, like we did a, tri a, ra a rafting trip on the Salmon River, um, multi-day rafting trip on the Salmon River this, this summer as a family, and there was, you know, zero screen use that entire time, um, which is great. I mean, I, I, at the end of that, 
I don't want to come back. Like, I don't want to. I don't want to start using a screen again. It's it's painful, actually, physically painful to come back into my environment. But it's also super restorative and and rejuvenating to be able to do that, and helps me keep things in perspective. So it's um, you know, again, it doesn't have to be five days. Just do one or two days the first time. But you know, work up to this stuff. It's it's worth the effort. Oh. And I mean, you're sort of preaching to the choir, but I used to love going to Europe and having no service and not getting emails or not getting on their, their plan to get anything because that's, that's exactly what happens. It's a full first couple of days, you may be reaching for your phone. And then, you know, by the middle of the trip, you're, you're so immersed in the experience that coming back is difficult. And there are now five-star hotels and places like Bali and Indonesia that do take your phone from you that offer yeah. to have a phone sleeping bag. So that's the dream. That is the dream. Um, so let's circle back. I know that we've been chatting for a little while. I just want to circle back on how you take care of your family from like a diagnostics and testing perspective. Um, I'm just curious as a mom and a pr practitioner myself, like how often would you recommend people do a physical on themselves if they generally eat, eat and feel healthy? Not very often. <laughs> people are surprised maybe when they hear me say that, but um, I'm, I'm not a big fan of going looking for problems unless you're, you're having a problem. And you no, know, I, I do annual blood work on myself and my wife. Uh, with my daughter, I don't think that's necessary uh, unless there's something going on that you know, seems like it would warrant that. I don't like subjecting her to blood draws mm -hmm. um, on a regular basis. And um, yeah, I'm pretty, I'm actually like, I think generally our, we're, we're, we're designed to function pretty well if we have the right inputs. And, you know, I've for, for many, many years have done a lot to reduce exposure to toxins and, you know, live a healthy lifestyle, need a healthy diet. So I feel like I'm pretty in touch with what's happening in my body and 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 if something is off I I tend to know about it and then that's what triggers the, the you know testing or, or or any kind of further action. Um for people who are maybe a little newer to this and and less familiar um with their rhythms I think certainly an annual comprehensive blood panel is probably one of the most important things you can do. Um, and when I say comprehensive, <laughs> unfortunately, that's different um, usually than what's available through the primary care doctor. Um, you know, I'm talking about a panel that includes lots of different blood sugar markers, fasting glucose, hemoglobin A1C, uh, post-meal blood sugar testing, you know, lipid panel, uh, all kinds of nutrients like magnesium, B12, iron, copper, zinc. Um, uh, metabolic panel, fat, full thyroid panel, CBC with sed rate and diff, which, you know, to get white blood cell, red blood cells, look for anemia and other kind of immune related stuff that could be happening, inflammatory markers like C reactive protein. This is like better than health insurance in a way. You know, I mean, of course, you need health. Uh, well, you don't absolutely. Lots of people don't have it, but, you know, it's good to have some way of covering unpredictable expenses, right? But right. The, I think, uh, Pay, you know, paying even if it's out of pocket for a comprehensive blood panel is a form of health insurance because you can detect problems before they become significant. Uh, for example, if you notice that your fasting blood glucose is trending into the 90s, maybe the mid 90s on a regular basis, you're not yet in the pre-diabetic range and a conventional doctor probably wouldn't look twice at that. But uh, that that is something that should raise an eyebrow, and you know if you get on top of that right away, then you stop. You you won't end up with prediabetes and and diabetes, and it's so much easier to prevent something from occurring than it is to reverse it once it's already occurred. So uh, that's just one example of what you can discover in a with a comprehensive blood panel. But there's so many others, and I think that probably makes the most sense. The only time. I would suggest, you know, screening for toxins is if there is a, an existing health problem and you have, uh, you know, you want to 
look for potential causes. We will often do that kind of testing in the clinic. Or if you are pretty convinced that you that, that there's been an exposure. So let's say you discover mold in your house, then it would probably be a good idea to do testing for mold. Or let's say you have uh, mercury dental amalgams and you're having some symptoms that you think could be related to chronic mercury uh, overexposure. That might be a good time to test for, for mercury. Or you live in an agricultural community and you know that there's a lot of pesticide use in that community. That's maybe a good time as well to uh, do some additional testing. So uh, while I am a big fan of testing uh, as a functional medicine practitioner, I'm also not a fan of, um, of excessive measurement and testing. Like I, I, I've had some patients over the years who would come in with spreadsheet after spreadsheet and they're, you know, testing themselves every three months uh, with the whole battery of tests. And I, I just, I generally think that that's not a good idea and it can lead to a lot of unnecessary intervention and a lot of anxiety and stress that's not necessary either. Well, that's, I think, why I've loved your approach for so long because even with your access to new types of testing to you know i remember when SIBO became a thing and i saw more and more patients being treated tested and then treated with SIBO, and i was getting patients from functional mds and we were doing fodmaps or whatever it was i mean sometimes it can be a strike mission and really be helpful for that patient to find out what the root cause is but you always have been about the basics diet, sleep, stress, and activity, and you're modeling it in your life for your daughter, Sylvie, and you've carved out this time for yourself personally as well. And it's just, you are a great role model and um, I've loved everything you've done for so long. So I just, I can't thank you enough for spending your time here with me today, Dr. Kresser. It's been amazing. Kelly, it's been a pleasure. I really enjoyed the interview and yeah, I hope everybody got a lot out of it. And just, I, I, I think it's really important to live life, you know, and enjoy life. And that's what this is really all about is, is enhancing that and extending our health span for as long as we can, but never forgetting, you know, the importance of those basics and, and, and even things we didn't get to touch on, like a play and pleasure and relationships and mission and purpose that are all just a vital part of being a, a happy, healthy, and well-adjusted human. So that's that's really what, what drives me. Well, you can't really do much of that or the deep work of that without getting off your screen. So I am going to link your Cal Newport interview to these show notes. I'm immediately going to go listen to it. And if anyone is listening, Revolution Health Radio, it has been, I have very few that I get automatic alerts for it that there's a new a new episode and yours is one of them thank you for for really beating the drum um with the basics and getting people out there to live their life and have fun thank you kelly and keep up the great work really appreciate what you do yeah where can people find you other than the revolution health radio so chriscresser.com is my uh, main website and then we also have training programs for practitioners licensed practitioners and and health coaches and that's cresserinstitute.com and then um, I am reluctantly on uh, Instagram <laughs> and Facebook as well. But you have blocks of time where you do that and you're not, you're, you're a default offline. It, exactly. Yeah. If, if you know my social media, then you know that I'm not on there all the time. Yeah. You, you might be going down in the algorithm. I have to search <laughs> you out. <laughs> yeah. 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 My marketing team is, has a, has a, it's, it's a, they accept who I am and they, they, they've learned to deal with it, but it's, it's not ideal for, um, you know, placement purposes on social media, but that's, <laughs> that's not enough of a reason for me to change my behavior. That's right. I can drive, I can drive, we'll drive some audience that way, this podcast <laughs> instead. All right. Thanks, <laughs> okay. Kelly. Thanks, Chris. Thank you for listening to Be Well by Kelly. Please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Learn more at bewellbykelly.com and follow me on Instagram at bewellbykelly. I would love if you picked up my books, Body Love and Body Love Every Day. They're sold on Amazon and at all major booksellers. 